Hello, and welcome to this video on the topic of moment of inertia. In this video, we'll talk about what moment of inertia is, what it represents, how we go about discovering what this moment of inertia is for an object, and we'll find out that it's dependent on an axis, and we're going to introduce something called the parallel axis theorem in order to allow us to quickly transform, if we know, uh, the moment of inertia for an axis through the center of mass. So what is moment of inertia? And the simplest way to explain it, it is the rotational analog of mass. What I mean by that is, in terms of translational motion, we know that F equals ma. And there, mass is basically telling us how much you resist a change to your translational motion. Since it's telling you, for a given force, how much acceleration do you end up with? And the moment of inertia does the same thing for our rotational motion. So the moment of inertia, denoted I, tells you how much angular acceleration, alpha, you get for a given torque, which is represented by tau. So it's playing this role of telling us how much do you resist being spun up or spun down. Okay, so it's talking simply about how hard it is to rotate an object about an axis. And so remember, with rotational things, you always need to know what it is you're rotating about. So there's some axis of rotation. Not surprising, this moment of inertia is actually going to depend on that axis. And we can motivate that simply by thinking, well, if I've got an axis which is far away from some particular amount of mass, then if I'm going to rotate at with some given angular acceleration, well, we know that the farther away we go, the larger tangential um, velocity and hence tangential acceleration that implies for the object. So, the farther away the mass is, clearly the larger the moment of inertia is. So it's going to have to, in some way, depend on that choice of the rotational axis. Because if you pick one through the mass, for instance, then you basically don't have to do anything. If you pick one far from it, you've got a lot of work to do to get that thing to move in a circle around your axis. Okay, so the way that that actually goes is if you pick some little amount of mass m and you've got it some distance r away from the axis, then that piece of mass contributes m r squared to your moment of inertia. And if you wanted to, you could then imagine that what you're going to do to figure out the moment of inertia of some complicated collection of masses or even a continuous distribution of masses is to sum over every tiny piece of mass that exists in your object and put it all together. And fortunately for us, this has already been done for many common objects. And there's a table of this in basically every textbook. Or you can just Google for one, common moments of inertia, and you'll find things like the moment of inertia of rectangular blocks um, rotate about their centers or about their ends, etc. Okay, so normally we can just use those. But that MR squared method is really how you find them. So the key thing here is it depends on the axis. And if it depends on the axis, then it would be nice, if you're going to go ahead and start tabulating things, it would be nice to make it more general than just give me an axis, then I've got to tabulate a value for that, now give me a different axis, and then basically create infinite number of uh, entries for every single shape that correspond to every possible choice of axis. And that's where this thing comes in. It's called the parallel axis theorem. And what it says is that if I've got some axis, so I was rotating, say, a rectangle initially around an axis through its center of mass, so I have a little rectangular something, and then I've got an axis through its center of mass around which I'm rotating. Then if I pick a new axis to rotate about, which is parallel to that axis, but shifted by some distance d, then all I have to do is just add md squared to whatever the moment of inertia was about the axis through the center of mass. That's how this um, parallel axis theorem works. All right. So that's quite fortunate and makes it easy to generalize those tables of known values. And then that just brings us to the summary of what moment of inertia is talking about. Again, 
is this thing that tells you how much you resist rotation. And it depends on a few things. It depends on your choice of axis. It depends on the distribution of mass around that axis. And that's ultimately saying that each little piece of mass, so I could do this little piece of mass here, by making a little cut through my rectangle, take out a little block, which has a mass of m. It's sitting, if I'm doing this new axis, it's sitting a distance r away. If I take mr squared, that's how much this little block of mass contributes to the moment of inertia, and I can sum over it to find the moment of inertia of the whole thing. But if we were already in possession of the moment of inertia of this block about its center of mass axis, then we can just talk about this new axis in terms of this shift by distance d and take i about the center of mass plus m, the mass of the whole thing, not just of the little block, times d squared. So hopefully that was a helpful introduction to moment of inertia. And just to keep thinking about it, try this question. All I want to know is if you take some axis and you find one, such that the moment of inertia about that axis is actually smaller than the moment of inertia about an axis passing through the center of mass of that same object.